focuses on Israel's security challenges along the northern borders. Um, and we see it as our personal mission to provide research and analysis of the geopolitical reality and the developments regarding Israeli security challenges on its northern border. Now, the ALMA Center is situated uh, in Israel's northern Galilee, which is only six miles away uh, from the border with Lebanon. So the ALMA team encounters these security challenges in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, the center provides unique and high-quality research on developments in Lebanon and Syria and their effect on Israeli security, mainly from Hezbollah in Lebanon and the Iranian uh, development of proxies, uh, as well as Iranian efforts to build a second Hezbollah uh, in Syria. Now, when it comes to uh, discussing uh, radical Shiite uh, centers around the globe, it's important to note that Iran has a long history of both sponsoring terrorism and actively engaging in it with its own units. Um, and it has spent decades building a global, highly active a Shiite terror network. Um, and we've had, you know, a lot of reminders just recently, such as in September 20, uh, a Bulgarian court convicted two suspected Hezbollah operatives uh, who were not present for that uh, uh, ruling for a 2012 bus bombing uh, in the resort city of Burgas, which killed five Israeli tourists and the Bulgarian bus driver. Um, and we've had constant reminders throughout the years um, Iranian Quds Force supplying Hezbollah cells worldwide with tons of ammonium nitrate explosive material. Um, we had a raid back in 2015 in London with British counterterrorism police uh, uncovering um, large quantities of ammonium nitrate stacked in ice packs. Um, and you know we can go we can go far back, uh, and some of our speakers I'm sure will. Um, we saw how in the aftermath of events in Iran. Uh, Iranian bombers attempted to kill Israeli diplomats. Um, and we even saw just this year, just a month and a half ago in India, uh, four suspects were uh, apprehended over an attempt to bomb the Israeli embassy in New Delhi in January this year in an attempt that has been linked to Iran. So the modus operandi seems pretty clear. It's Iranian agents and their proxies are targeting consistently uh, Israeli embassies, diplomats, and overseas interests. And Hezbollah often goes after the softer targets the Israeli civilian targets overseas. And of course, all of this is a major violation of the sovereignty of the countries where these attacks are planned. Um, yet only some countries in the world are willing to recognize Hezbollah's uh, quote unquote civilian branch as a terror organization. Um, there is a growing list, um, and this is good news, of countries that are outlaw outlawing the whole of Hezbollah, but the list is not yet complete. So exposing the real scope of the Iranian Shiite access and its activities overseas is part of the answer. It's important to raise awareness to this very important issue. And this is an issue that's all too often overlooked. Um, now, to help uncover more of this submerged iceberg, we are lucky to have with us an exceptional panel of experts. I'll just remind every speaker of the simple house rule, which is a 10 minutes for the presentation. And after that, we'll just shift into the Q&A. So I now have the pleasure of introducing Sarit Zahavi, who is the CEO and founder of ALMA. Um, she has served for 15 years in the Israeli military, a lieutenant colonel in the IDF reserves, uh, specializing in military intelligence. She has briefed hundreds of groups and forums, including US senators, uh, congressmen and women, politicians, senior journalists, and visiting VIP groups in Israel and overseas. Uh, Sarit has scripted many position papers and updates filled with critical insights on events in Lebanon, Syria, uh, in Israel's national security challenges. She holds an MA in Middle Eastern Studies from Ben Gurion University. And Sarit will be speaking about the radical Shiite access, uh, how it strives to create an active civilian and military integrated infrastructure in France. She's going to share with us important details of how Shiite centers of culture and social societies in France produce a communal influence under the guidance of the Iranian Shiite access and how this could create a platform for terrorist activity on European soil. So without further ado, Sarit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yaakov. I'm really excited to be with you today. Uh, what I would like to do in my 10 minutes is to present a report that we wrote uh, and published uh, a few months ago. We were focusing on the civilian activity of the radical shared access in Europe. And we chose deliberately France uh, to focus on France because France didn't designate the civilian wing of Hezbollah. And it was important for us to see whether what, what's going on over there, whether there is civilian activity and whether it's connected to Hezbollah in Iran. 
we were quite surprised from what we had found because uh, the main insight was that it doesn't really matter which country would you focus on. There is actually a, a non-state framework here of the Iranians that they are actually taking advantage of the Shiite communities uh, everywhere in the world, for example, Europe. Uh, they are operating with these uh, within these Shiite uh, communities, and uh, with the assistance of Hezbollah, uh, they are creating branches to associations uh, that are all connected to one umbrella association. So actually everywhere where there are uh, uh, Shiite communities, the Iranians are trying to create civilian infrastructure that can be used uh, in the future to other activities of the radical Shiite axis, whether it's a uh, terrorist or a uh, criminal. In France, for example, there is one uh, association named El Zahara that uh, was caught by the French authorities not too long ago. And they found that this uh, association is a part of a terror cell that was operating in France, in Brussels, in Austria. Uh, we had found two more associations that civilian, uh, in the civilian aspect, they operate right at the same way of as are, but we don't have indications that these two associations are also involved in terror or crime uh, by the Iranians. I want to share a screen with you to my presentation and to, so, to show you some uh, quotes of uh, the US and France and, and European authorities that are indicating that uh, it is difficult to prove, it is difficult to prove the connection between uh, the criminal side and the terrorist side. These associations have a high capability of concealing and changing names, uh, but and hiding under the cover of religious, educational and social activity for the benefit of the Shiite uh, society in France and elsewhere. Uh, but again, when we look at the big picture, we see connections uh, and very suspicious ones, and, and we'll elaborate. Um, I think this uh, slide can put things in order. There is one umbrella association named Ailul Bayat, which was founded by Khamenei in 1990. And it is uh, operating with full collaboration with the, the Iranian uh, uh, Force, the uh, IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. Uh, for example, one of the general secretary of Ailul Bayat, uh, Muhammad Muhsan Akhtari, was also one of the founders of Hezbollah. So the connections are clear. Under Ailul Bayat, there are many associations. Again, we brought three of these, which is uh, Azara that was closed in France, El Radir and Imam El Khoui. Both El Radir and Imam El Khoui have branches in other places of the world, and we focus in the branches in France. Beginning with El Zahara, it was founded in uh, 2005. Uh, the person that you see in the picture is Sheikh Jamal Kahiri. All founders had connections to Iran and Hezbollah. And they were involved uh, in an attempt to carry out a terrorist attack against an Iranian opposition conference that was held in southern France in 2018. Uh, and they were activated by uh, an Iranian personnel, probably intelligence, in the Austrian uh, embassy of Iran. Uh, these uh, terrorists were arrested by the French authorities and explosives and ammunition were found. The association was closed in France. Some of the, those who were arrested were sent to jail, including this person, Sheikh Tahiri, that you can see in the photo that behind him, there is a picture of Khamenei. Uh, and also, again, the net, uh, the terrorist net, including connections in Brussels, in Austria, and there were trials to members of the cells also in these countries. But I want to focus on the associations uh, that actually very little were published on, El Radir and El, El Khoui. And here are some examples about them. El Radir is, a, as I've said, an association that has a lot of branches in many places of the world. For example, in the Ivory Coast, we've seen connections between this association and an engineering company 
that is under sanctions, Lebanese engineering company that is under American sanctions because of its connections to Hezbollah. Um, the uh, founder of the French branch of this association, Sadr Adin Fadlala, comes from a very well-connected family uh, in Lebanon to Hezbollah. Uh, he was the founder of the branch in France, but today is uh, the uh, principal or the CEO of a mosque in Berlin that is also connected to Hezbollah and connected to a mosque of Hezbollah in the Dachia in southern Beirut. Uh, that is funded, of course, by Iran. Uh, not too long ago, uh, the, uh, the German authorities uh, raided this uh, mosque because of its connections to Hezbollah. The CEO of the French uh, branch of El Radir is Mohamed Farhat, which is well known in France as the go-to man of Hezbollah in Paris. And he hosted a person named Sharistani that you can see in the pictures. Uh, this Sharistani, who is uh, Iranian, has connections with Suleimani and with Nasrallah, uh, taking pictures with them. And both, by the way, both uh, associations, El Radir and El Khoui, hosted this person, uh, Sharistani. One interesting uh, report that we had found was a trial. Uh, an application that uh, the brother of the vice uh, pre, um, CEO of this association, the, the vice uh, president named Farhat, we don't know the name of the brother, and uh, the, the Farhat, I'm sorry, is the CEO, we don't know the name of the deputy, but his brother appealed for immigration uh, confirmation into France, and there was a trial in France and the French authorities refused uh, to permit his immigration into France because they said that his brother, who is the deputy CEO of the branch uh, association uh, El Radir uh, in France, is connected to Hezbollah, is connected to a terrorist organization. So the French authorities know on the connections between uh, the principals and the leaders of the associations in France to Hezbollah, and I think this is very interesting. Uh, another association is Al Khoui. Al Khoui is named after a, a Shiite a cleric, Iraqi Shiite cleric that was killed in Iraq, probably uh, or could be by Iranian uh, or supported by Iran, the Iranians, and. You know, after we published the report about El Khoui, we received some feedback that how do you do that? El Khoui is a liberal a player in the Islamic, uh, in the Shiite Islam. He comes from a, a family that is far away from the Iranian Ayatollah doctrine of Wilayat Fakim, meaning the doctrine that the political leader and the religious leader is the same leader. Uh, our uh, report uh, upset some Iraqis that protected this association and said that it's not connected to Iran. The association itself denied uh, our accusations that it is connected to Iran. But what I'm going to show you now, I don't know how to explain. And look at uh, the picture here. This is the son of El Khoui, who is the head of the, the, the London branch of El Khoui Association. He is meeting with an Iranian representative in London. He also visited Iran in 2017, and he was accepted there by uh, the representatives of the government, of the Iranian government uh, over there as well. Uh, another interesting point is that we have seen some connections of Iranian associations that are placed in London in financing and, and uh, currency trans transactions and money transactions, uh, Iranian uh, money to the Houthis in Yemen. Among these associations, also <clears throat> the El Khoui branch in London was mentioned. Uh, I guess uh, 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 an association that was connected to El Khoui, that is connected to El Khoui, there was an investigation in the United States. This foundation named Halabi, Foundation is connected to the IRGC and the FBI and the NYPD 
uh, which were involved in this uh, investigation, uh, actually banned this Halavi Foundation and the United States sanctioned this Halavi Foundation. Why is it interesting? Because you can see very clearly in the photo that the Halavi Foundation, uh, that El Khoui uh, Association is fundraising for Halavi Foundation, for a foundation that was banned and uh, sanctioned by the US. Uh, by the way, Halabi Foundation itself donated to El Khoui $25,000. So they kind of have a mutual uh, support, mutual collaboration, and El Khoui is still trying to put the pressure on the American authorities uh, to stop the support, uh, to stop the, the sanctions against uh, Halabi Foundation. We published our report on June 9th, and as you can see in this tweet, only a few days later, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, the, the US State Department, uh, the nearest uh, bureau, uh, suddenly published this announcement saying that El Khoui Association or Foundation is a well-recognized international charity. By the way, it is a association that is uh, having a consultant uh, position in the UN, uh, well-recognized. And also FOE denied any connection to Iran, any connection to Ayul Bayat, any connection to terror. Uh, though we uh, proved uh, connections between Ayul Bayat and El Khoui, between El Khoui and al Foundation, between El Khoui and Iran, and it was very awkward to see this announcement uh, of the State Department right after we published our report. We probably made somebody upset over there. Uh, one last thing. Uh, again, it's, it's really difficult to find indications, but you know, uh, if this association uh, is spreading peace and love, and Western values and human rights values uh, around the world. So how come they are connected not only with Iranians, but also with uh, an American Shiite Imam that is expressing against Israelis and Jews and saying that the Jews are, the Israelis are the one who actually uh, promoted ISIS. I wanna show you a short video of this person. His name is Kwazini and he was hosted by Al Khoui Foundation uh, in 2014, this is his speech in 2017. He's one of the leading Shiite Imams in the United States. All of you know who established ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and all these terrorist organizations. You know very well. You know who paid for them, who financed them, who helped them who purchased weapon for them, who even trained them, who protected them. You know that. This is not the production of Islam. Islam is not responsible for ISIS. There are certain agencies and governments who established, they put hand in hand to establish ISIS to demolish Islam from within. This was the plan. And every day we discover, it's not, we don't discover the rest. We knew this, we knew the story from the beginning. When ISIS occupied Mosul three years ago, I gave a speech in Iraq. I said, ISIS is the protection, uh, is the uh, protection, the protection of the Israeli intelligence. The Israeli intelligence. Most of their officers were trained in Israel, including Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Uh, I'll stop over here. I think you understand the message and I'll give the floor to you, Lapin. Thank you very much, Sarip, for a fascinating presentation and um, something that really helps us understand uh, the gray zone in which these entities operate in um, and their attempts to uh, sometimes evade uh, their ideology and connections and intentions. Um, now, our next speaker is Dr. Emmanuel Otolenghi. Uh, Emmanuel is a senior fellow at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies and an expert at FTD's Center on Economic and Finance Power, focused on Hezbollah's Latin America illicit 
networks and Iran's history of sanctions evasion. Um, his research has examined Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, uh, including its links to the country's energy sector and procurement networks. His area of expertise also includes the EU's Middle East policymaking, uh, transatlantic relations, the Arab-Israeli conflict, and Israel's domestic politics. Uh, prior to joining the FDD, Emmanuel headed the Transatlantic Institute in Brussels and taught Israel studies at St. Anthony's College at Oxford University. Um, he's the author of three books and blogs at The Hill, um, and his columns have appeared in outlets such as The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, and London's Sunday Times. Uh, now, Emmanuel will, will be speaking to us about two important themes, soft power uh, propaganda through Shiite cultural centers and the illicit finance networks that are linked uh, to trafficking. Uh, so without further ado, Emmanuel, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> good evening, Israel. Good afternoon, America. Uh, greetings from Italy. Um, I haven't gone skiing, but uh, you, can, you can pretend that I have based on my background uh, screen, the beauties of, uh, of Zoom. I um, wanted to, since we have all a very limited amount of time, I just want to bring up a couple of uh, things that should help us uh, uh, focus on this important topic and, and uh, have our debate uh, later on in the Q&A. The first is that from its founding, the Islamic Republic of Iran has made its core vocation uh, a centerpiece of foreign policy, namely the export of the Iranian revolution. That export, of course, has had its successes and setbacks, but it is a long-term project that the Islamic Republic has never given up on. And a key component of that effort uh, is uh, the soft power outreach that targets not just Shia communities overseas, but also non-Shia, non-Muslims. Now, a key, a key institution that uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran has used over the years is a uh, religious uh, seminary called Al Mustafa International University that is based in Qom, uh, Iran, the city of seminaries. Previously, uh, before its establishment in 2007, uh, Al Mustafa. Uh, Mustafa's activities were run by several other seminaries that then were brought together under one umbrella. The umbrella is, of course, the office of the supreme leader. And Al Mustafa is focused exclusively on uh, non Iranians. It seeks to train into the ways of Iran's revolutionary Shia worldview. Uh, people of all backgrounds from outside Iran. Um, it clearly has targeted uh, community, Islamic communities uh, in the near abroad of Iran. It has a presence in Herat, Afghanistan, in India, uh, in Lebanon itself. Uh, but uh, it also has sent clerics around the world in order to um, build their own local startups and seek to recruit uh, supporters to the cause. Now, as you mentioned, I focus a lot on Latin America and Latin America has been a hub of this activity, perhaps one of the earliest targets because Iran uh, correctly identified Latin America as a fertile ground for the export of its revolutionary ideals. Not because it is uh, uh, you know, necessarily a continent with vast uh, and well-established uh, Muslim diasporas, uh, although there is a significant historic Arab uh, presence, uh, the migrants who came from the Middle East to Latin America at the, at the end of the 19th century, turn of the 20th, were mostly Christians. There is a Muslim minority uh, in Latin America, one that is growing but the Shia component is the minority within the minority. 
But what they understood was that Latin America uh, and to a certain extent also Africa were uh, regions where there were movements or governments that were ideologically aligned or converging on the goals of Iran. And so they sought alliances in those countries and they sought alliances not just with governments, but also with political movements that were clearly um, opposed to the United States, radicalized uh, in anti-imperialist ideology, whichever version you want to pick. And so Latin America proved to be promising. The first cleric to reach Latin America, man who has later on gained uh, notoriety uh, for his involvement in terror attacks, was uh, Sheikh al-Islam Mohsen Rabbani, sent to Argentina in 1982, at a time when there was only one Shia mosque in the country and the community was not particularly observant. Rabbani was uh, the spearhead of the effort that today has produced dozens of centers across the entire region from Mexico all the way to Chile. Um, and Al Mustafa is the uh, breeding ground for the clerics that work in these centers. And again, Iran has targeted locals, sought to recruit, indoctrinate, convert, and then bring them back to Iran for training purposes. So Al Mustafa today has a Latin American department alongside departments for other continents, regions, and languages. And the department produces literature in Spanish and Portuguese. It produces classes online. It produces books. Uh, children's uh, magazines, adolescent um, reading material, highbrow uh, uh, academic journals, um, um, more easily approachable publications, focusing on a variety of themes that include, of course, politics and history. And just to uh, give you a, an example, one of the things that uh, the Latin American Department of Al Mustafa has produced is a translation of a book by Roger Garaudy, the famous or infamous French uh, Holocaust denial, denier um, that goes by the title of Israel's Foundational Myth. So this is clearly not just a, uh, a, a spiritual outreach. It is clearly a politically driven uh, project that seeks to recruit, uh, convert, uh, and gain supporters. And the cultural centers are fronts for at the very least this type of outreach activity. They recruit people locally. They emphasize um, agenda, political agendas that speak to the local uh, country and population. Uh, so for example, in many countries in Latin America, the local cultural centers and activists focus on indigenous rights uh, or other such uh, uh, social uh, themes that may not have much to do with Islam or with Iran indeed, but that are vehicles and vectors for recruitment. So this is one important component and it is not a menial or small trivial project. Al Mustafa has thousands of teachers. Uh, it has over 50,000 graduates at this point. Um, it uh, teaches in dozens of languages. It produces uh, reading material, online material uh, in dozens of languages. Its affiliates uh, across the world operate TV stations, radio stations, publishing houses. Just to give you an example, in uh, late December uh, 2020, uh, to mark the one year anniversary of the assassination of Iranian uh, uh, Quds Force General Qasem Soleimani, uh, a publishing house based in Colombia named El Farolito released a book uh, called Mi Tio Soleimani, my uncle or my friend Soleimani, uh, which is addressed to an adolescent reading public. You can buy it on Kindle for $1. Uh, I haven't yet. Uh, I don't know if it is a smash hit, but uh, uh, it certainly indicates a significant infrastructural organizational sophistication on their part and it relies entirely on a network that is foreign based 
This is not something done in Iran. It is done by converts, in this case in Colombia. Uh, and it relies uh, on people who are native speakers, familiar with the culture, and therefore promote best place to promote uh, the type of um, uh, uh, messaging that resonates in their own specific countries. Now, aside from these activities, the cultural centers also serve as a support network for Hezbollah. And I want to give you one example, as probably many of you know, uh, one of my research focuses over the years has been the tri-border area of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay where there is a significant Hezbollah presence that has focused a lot on money laundering uh, for terror finance purposes. But alongside that activity, you've also, you also see the synergy of forces between the Lebanese expatriate community supportive of Hezbollah and the Iranian uh, regime uh, driven activities. And the best example there is the uh, one of the sheikhs in the tri-border area, Sheikh uh, Hassan uh, uh, Abdallah, he is one of uh, several brothers of a very prominent Lebanese family there. One of his brothers is the owner and founder of the Shia mosque uh, on the Paraguayan side of the tri-border area. Uh, he is under sanctions uh, for being also the owner of uh, one of the key money laundering hubs of Hezbollah in Paraguay called Galeria Page. So one of the brothers of this family, Ghassan Abdallah, is a sheikh, and he is responsible for the Shia center in Chile. Now, Chile, of all places in Latin America, is one where the number of, pres of Shia presence is quite sparse. We're talking about only a few thousand uh, spread between Santiago del Chile, um, and uh, several trade towns in the north, Iquique, uh, and also near the Peruvian border. But the community in Santiago is extremely small. And this is where this gets very interesting because these activities in countries like Chile where Shia Islam is not very well known and it's not widespread and doesn't have much of a following, the centers remodel themselves to fit the local agenda. And so in the case of the center in Chile run by a Hezbollah cleric, the messaging is we are the champions of the Palestinian cause. Why in Chile? Because in Chile, there is the largest Palestinian diaspora uh, in the world. There is a very large and well-established community, mostly of Christians, so not very particularly attracted to the Shia messaging of the Iranian revolution but attracted because radicalized in favor of Hamas and the Palestinian rejectionist position. And so Iran is capitalizing uh, on that uh, agenda through Arabic speaking clerics linked to Hezbollah that come from the tri-border area. And of course, the, the people who are involved in this outreach program always have also connections to the money laundering side of the activities. And what you see oftentimes, of course, in these money laundering networks is that behind the Hezbollah run operation, you may encounter sooner or later an Iranian controller or a Lebanese individual who is not a Hezbollah member, but works or represents the Quds forces uh, and acts as a liaison. So oftentimes what you find if you dig deep enough is a full integration of the money laundering effort, terror finance effort, the soft power outreach effort, and the infrastructure that these three poles create can of course be leveraged where needed, and it has been done in the past, certainly in Latin America, for the terrorist uh, planning wherever and whenever an order comes to do so. The best exam recent example, of course, is the one in New Delhi, because the people who were arrested all came from one village, which has an Ahlul Bayt uh, assembly institute affiliated with Iran. These were Indians, but converted to Shia Islam or Shia themselves, radicalized by the Iranian effort there. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to the questions. 
thank you uh, very much, uh, Emmanuel, for that uh, fascinating presentation. I mean, just a note to both the audience members uh, and the panel, we are going to run a little bit over time, uh, a few minutes, um, and that's all right. We're going to leave room for questions as well. So uh, don't uh, worry uh, if you are concerned about getting your question in, uh, we will see it. Um, and we will now move uh, to our next speaker, uh, Joseph um, Humeyer, Executive Director of the Center for a Secure Free Society. Uh, Joseph is a global security expert specializing in analyzing trans-regional threats uh, in the Western Hemisphere. He provides regular briefings and lectures on international terrorism, uh, transnational in, uh, organized crime, Islamism, and Iran and Hezbollah's influence in the Americas to various entities within the U.S. national security community, um, as well as uh, prominent think tanks and universities worldwide. Uh, Joseph has testified numerous times before the U.S. Congress, as well as the European and Canadian Parliament, and he has served as an expert witness to several important terrorism trials uh, in South America, including an ongoing trial of an accused Hezbollah operative in Peru. Uh, he is a regular national security commentator for a variety of a major English and Spanish uh, language media, and he has a regular weekly segment called uh, The New World Report on the nationally syndicated uh, John Batchelor show. And Joseph will be talking to us about how Iran and Hezbollah have developed a state and non-state network in Latin America over the last 35 years. He'll discuss uh, the twin bombings in Buenos Aires and uh, describe how uh, these efforts have evolved to include military cooperation with select Latin American governments uh, with a focus on Venezuela and Bolivia, uh, which of course is disturbing. Um, so Joseph, the floor is yours. Okay, well, first of all, thank you. And uh, um, a warm welcome to all the folks that are connected online and those who are gonna be watching this uh, video once it's posted online. Uh, thank you to the Alma Center for organizing this important discussion. Thank you to Sarit for inviting me to give the, the privilege of being able to share the panel with two very good friends and distinguished colleagues, both Emmanuel Otelengi and Alon Berman are two folks that I've learned a lot from. Uh, we've been able to share information and really kind of grow a better understanding of how Iran is operated. In Latin America, I'm gonna compliment a lot of what Manuel said, but also uh, throughout the world with what Elon's been looking at in Africa. And I, I learned a lot from Sarit's presentation. So thank you for that as well. I'm gonna share a PowerPoint with you. So hopefully technology doesn't fail me. So if you give me uh, two seconds, let's uh, hope this works. All right, here we go. I think we have it here. Just give me the thumbs up to say that you can see it. Good to go. Okay. So what, I, what I'm going to do for the next 10 minutes, and I, and I am worried I put too much what for the when, so please let me know if I'm trying to go too long. But what, I, what I'm going to try to do over the next 10 minutes or so is give you a little bit of a chronological history on what Iran's been doing in Latin America, particularly as it pertains to the topic of, of, of the, the webinar, which is these radical Shiite Islamist centers that essentially are an entry point uh, for Iran to be able to establish this network uh, all throughout the world and in, in, in Latin America, it, it's no different. Uh, a lot of this is going to complement, and I'm going to put some names and faces to what Emmanuel was saying when he described uh, how Iran's essentially been erecting this network uh, in Latin America, which I uh, agree pretty much with everything Emmanuel said. So this is going to complement uh, his remarks and his presentation. So I'll begin with something that I think everybody here knows about, which is uh, the largest Islamist terrorist attack in uh, Latin America. In fact, it was the largest terrorist, Islamist terrorist attack in the Western Hemisphere prior to 9-11, uh, which was the twin bombings in Buenos Aires, both in 1992 against the Israeli embassy and then in 1994 against the AMIA Cultural Center. Um, the day after the bombings, there was a second, uh, a third attack actually that is not as discussed as much, but being that I just came back from Panama, Thing it's definitely worth mentioning, which was a, the takedown of a flight a la Chiricanas uh, uh, that was traveling from the Cologne Free Trade Zone to Panama City, uh, killing all 21 people on board. So altogether, if you take these three attacks that happened in a very short period of time within two years, you're, you're talking about uh, generally about 135 people that were killed on Latin American soil, many of them Latin Americans, not just Israelis, or not just Americans, US citizens, but uh, Latin Americans, Argentinians, Panama Panamanians, and other nationalities 
that were in AMIA or on the flight in Panama uh, when it was taken down. Uh, one of the individuals that uh, Emmanuel mentioned that uh, uh, merits a, a more mention because he's uh, essentially, he's kind of like the, 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 the godfather of the Iranian network in uh, Latin America is Mokshin Rabani uh, because he was dubbed as the intellectual author of the, particularly the 1994 AMI attack, although he was involved likely in all the other attacks that happened in Latin America at the time. Some of the interesting things to talk about, uh, to, to point out when you talk about Rabani is his uh, cover platform, like how he came into the country in 1982. Uh, and he had a, what I call a, a triple cover. He had a uh, cultural cover because he came at, with uh, under the guise of an imam and he's going to set up cultural centers in, in Argentina. He came with a commercial cover because he was uh, also related to the inspection of the beef exports that were going from Argentina to Iran. We're going to get more into that in a minute. And then at the end of his mandate, he had a diplomatic cover because he was given diplomatic credentials as a cultural attache right towards the end of his uh, term in, in, in Argentina before he before the AMIA bombing and, and, and he left shortly uh, thereafter from Argentina. So this triple cover, this triple cover platform, cultural, commercial, and diplomatic is part of the modus operandi that Iran carries forward to today. They still use that method and a lot of, they've extended it. So I think it's beyond just those three elements, but when it comes to how the Iranian embassies have been able to legitimize the presence of some of their uh, intelligence and other operatives uh, in the countries in, in Latin America, uh, that triple cover has been uh, relevant. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk uh, through the period of four decades, essentially, so that people understand and appreciate how long and, and, and how evolved the presence of Iran in Latin America has been uh, over pretty much since the dawn of the, the 1979 Iranian revolution, shortly after Rabani arrives. One more quick point on Rabani is that he arrived also, uh, he came from Germany. Uh, so he was working in the Islamic centers in Hamburg in Germany prior to arriving in Argentina and he transited through Spain. And I think that's an important point because a lot of Iran's uh, efforts in Latin America were initiated in Madrid because of the Ibero-American connection between Europe and Latin America uh, and the importance of the language and the culture that a lot of the Iranian intelligence operatives received in Europe and Spain in particular prior to coming to, to, to South, Central and South America. Oh, just one last thing, I forgot this was in there. Uh, one of the individuals in the Panama case, since I just came back from Panama, is uh, now being investigated by the FBI. This is a, a notice that was put out very recently because he's uh, residing in Margarita Island in Venezuela. So we'll talk about Venezuela in a bit as well. So let me begin the story. The story begins uh, with uh, Moshe Rabani, it begins with the presence in Argentina. Uh, there was already six embassies that were uh, active in Latin America at the time. Those embassies predate the Iranian revolution. They, a lot of them got started up with the founding of OPEP and the oil deals that created throughout the 1950s and 60s. Uh, and then the Islamic cultural centers were based out of the Islamic communities that were very few and far between at the time in S South America, mostly noted in the tri-border area, in uh, the crossroads of Paraguay, Brazil, and Argentina, but also in uh, Colombia, Venezuela, and then a smaller community in Guyana. Uh, one of the individuals that uh, kind of erected the Hezbollah network within these Shia communities that were in South America is still a very active Hezbollah uh, uh, ESO leader at the Unit 910 External Security Organization, Islamic Jihad Organization leader, which is Salman Raouf Salman. The interesting thing about Salman Rouh Salman is he's a Colombian born Lebanese national that uh, married an Argentinian, so still maintains a very strong network in Latin America. And to this day is very active, not just in terrorist operations in Latin America, but in terrorist operations worldwide. He was implicated in the terrorist plots in Bangkok, uh, Thailand and, and New Delhi, India. Uh, I can't remember the years exactly, 2014, 15 timeframe. Um, and so this story starts uh, with them. And then there's an interesting component that wasn't discussed as much in the investigations of uh, Alberto Nisman, who's the, the special prosecutor that investigated the AMI attack that was assassinated in uh, 2015. But um, it, it, it discussed it, 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 it's in the intelligence files of the Argentine intelligence services who were looking and supported Nisman's work. And that specific uh, 
angle is the terror finance angle. How Iran used its diplomatic and commercial relations to be able to set up a financial network that was then used to carry out the twin bombings in 92 and 94. That specific commercial linkage is in the beef trade. So at the time, we're going back to the, the 80s, Iran, the only connection that Iran had with, uh, I'm sorry, the only connection that Iran had with uh, South America was with beef. Uh, I believe at the time by 1987, uh, Ar Argentina was in the top five uh, exporters of beef to Iran. And that was very normal because Argentine beef was very well uh, internationally acclaimed. And uh, obviously it was a privilege for Iran to be able to have that commercial relationship with Argentina, but rather than enjoying it on commercial terms, I mean, you're getting some of the best beef in the world from one of the, the best providers of beef, which is Argentina. They exploited that commercial relationship to augment their intelligence services inside their embassy. What they used is they used the practice of halal, which is the, the process of certification of beef being that Iran is an Islamic Republic, that they had to essentially certify all the beef that was being uh, sent from Argentina to Iran to ensure that it stood up to Islamic practices. Uh, and so that uh, obviously was a foreign concept for Argentina uh, to this day, but definitely a foreign concept back in the 1980s. So their foreign ministry had very little argument to be able to uh, reject uh, cultural attaches that were being sent to uh, uh, Buenos Aires uh, in the dozens. Uh, this is how the Iranian embassy in Buenos Aires went from 13 diplomatic official representatives in 1983 in the Iranian embassy in Buenos Aires to almost 60 uh, diplomatic representatives in 1993 prior to the Amiya bombing, uh, a good portion of those being cultural attaches that were inspecting the beef trade. Uh, there's a quick anecdote on this that I wanna share just to show you that the network that was used to carry out the Amiya bombing extended well beyond the tri-border area in Argentina and extended even to places as obscure as Peru uh, was because uh, two, a month, approximately a month before the AMI attack, uh, AMI attack took place in 1994. Uh, the AMI attack took place on July 18, 1994. And approximately a month, maybe a little bit more, a, a Iranian businessman named Hossein Parsa arrived in Buenos Aires to basically take charge of the largest state-owned enterprise in the beef trade, which was a company called GTC, Government Trading Corporation. So he takes the mantle of GTC and within weeks of arriving in Buenos Aires, he expedites a visa to go to Peru uh, and travels to Peru, uh, to Pura, uh, Peru, and uh, comes back to Buenos Aires on, check the date, comes back to Buenos Aires on July 17th, 1994, the day before the bombing. He then leaves uh, Buenos Aires two weeks after the bombing and is never heard from again. Two years prior, to the 1994 attack in Argentina, Nidal Basun, who is a suspected Hezbollah operative, went to Peru uh, uh, coming through a route because he married a nurse that he met, a Peruvian nurse that he met in Buenos Aires through these Islamic centers. They all radicated inside an Islamic center called Ataquid, that was the one set up by uh, Moksha Ravani. And he uh, uh, set up the network for Jose Parsa to arrive in Peru back in the early 90s, just so you get a sense of how long and extensive these networks were even back then. We're talking about the 1980s and 1990s. After that uh, attack, obviously there's a period where we go into the second decade, which is from 94 to 2004, where Iran has to transition a little bit uh, its uh, personnel and its, and its uh, operations, given that in Buenos Aires, things got a lot hotter for them since they were uh, suspected of being in, in involved in the attack uh, immediately after the attack took place. A lot of the intelligence personnel that was supporting this attack, terrorist attack, that were residing in the uh, Iranian embassy in Buenos Aires migrated to Uruguay and to uh, Brazil. Uh, to, to this date, the Iranian embassy in Brasilia and in Montevideo are still very active in terms of intelligence operations that Iran carries out in South America. In fact, the uh, Iranian embassy in Montevideo is very active, uh, much more than uh, what you would think of when it comes to a country that it probably very few have paid attention to, which is Uruguay. Uh, in that, uh, a new generation of converts uh, are being recruited. And even though Moshe Rabani left uh, Latin America and went back to Iran, his brother, 
uh, Mohammed Bakr Rabani remained in Brazil and was operating in some of the Islamic centers that they set up in Curitiba. And a new generation of converts such as Abdul Qadr emerged onto the scene. Uh, Abdul Qadr was recruited way back in the 1980s. Uh, his uh, original birth name is Michael Seaforth and he's a, a Guyanese. He actually became very politically relevant as the mayor of Linden and was considered an imam for the Caribbean, not just for Guyana, but for all the Caribbean and implicated in a terrorist uh, plot that was uh, busted uh, several years later, I believe in 2006, when uh, these networks were trying to bomb the JFK International Airport in New York City. Uh, and so these new generation of converts uh, basically become politically prominent in many parts of Latin America and start to erect additional networks that come into, into fruition during the turn of the century into the 21st century. When we go into the third decade from 2004 to 2014, essentially Excuse Iran- seconds. Thanks. Okay, I'm sorry, are, are we finishing up on time? Yeah, you, you have 60 more seconds, go, go ahead. Oh, okay, so I'm gonna get okay. to the conclusion because otherwise I'm gonna bore you guys with a lot of these details. Essentially, the network explodes. The network explodes, they move into Venezuela, they move into Bolivia, and today, a lot of the Islamic centers that reside in Latin America, there's, there's approximately 82, according to Southern Command, the combatant command that monitors Latin America, have gained more connections to elites, both in the political arena and in the economic arena of the countries in which they operate. I'll give you a small example of Peru. In Peru, the new incoming president of Peru, which is Pedro Castillo, who was just announced uh, by the Peruvian electoral authorities yesterday, has connections to these Islamic centers uh, that are eradicating in that country. Uh, and let me just give one last point to, to finish up. This is a little bit of the before and after to make my final point is uh, Ilana and I have had the, the opportunity to co-edit a book back in 2014 that probably needs an update. But the point of the book was that Iran has a very uh, gradual that's uh, in, in strategic plan for how they're going to increase their presence in Latin America to the point of having military capabilities. Now we're starting to see that now in the last few years where in Venezuela and Bolivia, the IRGC is being able to operate in ways that would have been inconceivable two decades ago. But for, if you appreciate kind of what we've been discussing over the last more than 10 minutes, it essentially has been how Iran has gradually cultivated these steps to be able to get to that capability. And it always begins with these Islamic centers that they erect in the religious arena in Latin America. So I'll end with that and, and then I'll turn to Alon and, and perhaps some questions later. Great, thank you very much, Joseph, uh, for that fascinating presentation and uh, disturbing as, as well. Um, I'm sure that uh, there are a lot of questions uh, popping up in the audience's mind, um, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure amongst other panelists as well. Let's move uh, to our fourth speaker, uh, Elon Berman, the Senior uh, Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council in Washington, D.C. Uh, Elon is an expert on regional security in the Middle East, uh, Central Asia, and the Russian Federation. He has consulted for the CIA as well as for the U.S. Departments of State and Defense. And he has provided assistance on foreign policy and national security issues to a range of government agencies and congressional offices. Uh, he is one of America's leading experts uh, on the Middle East and Iran. And he's a member of the Associated Faculty at Missouri State University's Department of Defense uh, and Strategic Studies. He's a frequent writer and commentator. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, the New York Times, Foreign Policy, the Washington Post, and USA Today, among many other publications. And uh, Elon is the author of five books. Uh, today, he's going to be talking to us about Iran's strategy and strategic objectives on the African continent, a recent Iranian activity, and what the implications are uh, for the United States uh, and for, for regional and global security. Uh, so Elon, the floor is yours. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Yaakov. And thank you to Sarit and to the Alma Center for inviting me. I, I kind of want to do a little bit of a zoom out. Um, we, we spent a lot of time so far talking about uh, the uh, soft power aspect of Iranian strategy and how Iran uses dawa and proselytization and uh, cultural influence to advance its objectives. Um, it's necessary to understand that the, this uh, approach is part of a larger strategy. And so that last slide that Joseph showed 
I think is a very, very good place to start. Um, because uh, what you see in, and in my presentation, I want to focus really on four points because we don't, we don't have uh, a lot of time. Um, but I think as I talk, the, the first point is going to become apparent. And that's that Iran's presence in Africa follows a familiar pattern. And that game plan that Joseph laid out in his final slide, uh, the move from informal to formal uh, penetration and formal level of activity uh, is very similar uh, to what we're now seeing in Africa. And I would argue this is very logical. And it's logical because the Iranian regime sees the strategy that it has implemented in Latin America over the last three decades as being a successful one. Um, it's helped the regime skirt Western sanctions. It's helped the Iranian regime improve its ties to anti-American regimes in the Western hemisphere, and also to build a latent operational network. So I don't think it's a surprise that what we're now seeing taking shape in Africa follows this same general blueprint. It's a winning strategy as far as Tehran is concerned. So that's the first point. Uh, second point is that Iran's presence in Africa isn't new. Uh, Iranian activity on the continent dates back to the early 1980s, but it has largely been disorganized and opportunistic and uh, only lately has become more formal and uh, following a, a clear strategy. But all the way back in the mid 1980s, a, a now declassified US intelligence community assessment, um, which you can find if you go on the Central Intelligence Agency's website, um, documents how <clears throat> even back then, even uh, in the early 1980s, Iran viewed Africa as a valuable source of international legitimacy, as a support theater for its foreign policy efforts and for its economic expansion, and also as an extraterritorial military and intelligence base of operations. Um, and the result was that multiple Iranian entities, uh, including the IRGC, the Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, the Iranian Red Crescent Society, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, among other entities, expanded their activities on the continent in the years immediately after the 1979 revolution. And they did so through a number of means, uh, ranging from the establishment of new embassies, uh, the dispatching of trade delegations, the provision of humanitarian aid, and the deployment of military advisors. And the regime in tandem also promoted the missionary activities of clerics throughout the continent with the objective of spreading Iran's religious worldview and ideological message. But simultaneously, Iran, just like in Latin America, Iran developed and utilized these connections and connections with local sources to do more, to uh, begin to view uh, Africa as a source of external legitimacy and to use engagement with the continent as a way of increasing its asymmetric footprint and bolster its standing on the world stage. In other words, um, what I'm going to talk about next, the contemporary Iranian strategy in Africa dates back to the earliest days of the revolution. This is about continuity. It isn't about change. Uh, what we're seeing in Africa is a evolution of a longstanding strategy. So what is that strategy, really? Um, the Iranian approach to Africa that we're seeing now is ongoing, and it consists of four separate parts, which not coincidentally, because Joseph and I have worked uh, quite a bit together, um, uh, looks very much like that last slide that he showed, uh, moving from the uh, informal to the formal. Uh, in this case, I, I sort of want to work backwards because I think it's necessary to understand that at least in Africa, the informal nature of Iranian activity and influence is much more important um, in terms of what the regime is trying to accomplish. Uh, in, on the formal diplomatic level, uh, Iran's relations in, with Africa are still in formation. Iran currently has embassies in 20 of the continent's 54 countries, and this fairly surface level penetration has a lot to do with regional misgivings about the regime's informal economic and political activities among local governments on the continent, and also other external actors like Saudi Arabia. Um, uh, Morocco and others that are actively messaging to their re, uh, to regional neighbors or to their uh, the countries in Africa to disengage or at least to minimize their relations with Iran. Um, on the economic level, over the last two decades, expanding Western sanctions have significantly impacted the Iranian economy. And uh, what we saw from 2018 to 2020, the maximum pressure policy of the Trump administration 
was only the latest example uh, of the type of widening economic pressure that has been levied against the Iranian regime. Um, although uh, arguably it, it, it was sort of the, the most effective period of Western sanctions that we've seen so far. But for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so the Iranians in response to widening and deepening Western sanctions have consistently sought out new markets both uh, to stabilize their domestic economy because all politics are local and they're very worried about uh, economic destabilization as being a source of instability um, for their own internal political situation, but also in terms of uh, being able to skirt sanctions. And Africa, like Latin America, has emerged as a focal point of, uh, for the regime as a result. So. Trade with Africa uh, on the part of the Iranian regime is modest, but it's stable. Between 2010 and 2019, Iran exported between 600 million and $1 billion in goods and services annually to Africa, with the majority going to markets in Egypt, South Africa, Kenya, Sudan, and Tanzania. Iran is now attempting to expand the volume and strength of this, these trade ties. And in fact, since 2018, uh, the Iranian foreign ministry has made economic expansion into Africa, a major uh, priority of its ministry. Um, so that's sort of the formal uh, footprint that you see from Iran uh, in Africa. And it, while it's notable, it's dwarfed by what we're seeing on the informal, on the asymmetric level. So the first thing we see here is the asymmetric military presence, which is largely carried out by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, and in particular, its paramilitary arm uh, known as the Quds Force, which has a dedicated North Africa director. And the reason I flag this as significant is because the focus of the regime historically has been North and West Africa, but increasingly uh, what we're seeing is, is a regime that's moving around the entirety of the African continent. So the primary efforts uh, that the RGC is engaged in in Africa involve training, arming, and financing of terror and proxy groups, it's been implicated in continental arms smuggling, uh, including in the Wallace Sahel region that lies right under North Africa. And it's been implicated as well in uh, regional assassination of political figures. Um, and this is part of a larger pattern, uh, this last point, uh, because regime elements have been found to be complicit in over 360 assassinations and terrorist attacks in over 40 countries, uh, including African states, since 1979. Um, but what you're also seeing is that uh, the IRGC is very deftly using uh, empty political space and regional conflicts uh, in Africa in order to expand its activities. And this includes uh, Nigeria and the, the sort of the uh, anti-government uh, Islamist insurgency that's taking place there uh, in Somalia, uh, uh, choosing sides in uh, the Western Sahara dispute uh, that's taking place between Morocco and the leftist Polisario Front. Um, and so this is a very active arena for Iranian activity, um, but probably uh, equal to, uh, if not greater than, um, is the area of Dawa, of proselytization. Um, Iran has used vehicles like Al Mustafa University to spread the Iranian worldview on the continent. And what we're looking at here is an educational institution that seeks to spread revolutionary ideology and promote Shiism as a way of replicating uh, the Iranian style of religious governance abroad, or at the very least, uh, creating a more permissive environment, a more sympathetic environment among uh, African Muslims for the Iranian brand, so to speak. Um, but AMU is not the only actor in this domain. Uh, we have uh, institutions like the Islamic Culture and Relations Organization, which uh, promotes Shiism and Iranian culture abroad, which is subordinate to the Ministry of Culture and operates as the uh, ministry's foreign wing. And it focuses on cultural and religious exchanges through the deployment of cultural attaches uh, to embassies, the development of cultural centers, and uh, through a variety of activities that's, that are designed to sort of to, to create the groundwork for a more positive view of the Iranian regime and of Iranian foreign policy on the continent. And as compared, especially as compared to Latin America, this is considered by Iran to be a target rich environment. Uh, Emmanuel talked in his remarks about how Latin America is uh, sort of very, very nominally Muslim. 
Um, and therefore, the Iranian regime has an uphill climb in terms of trying to socialize its ideas. Um, it has a less uh, significant climb in Africa. Um, what you see is that uh, approximately 15% of Muslims in sub-Saharan Africa are Shia. That rises to 20% when you look at the countries of North Africa. So for the in terms of Iranian influence, in terms of Iranian soft power, there's a lot more for the Iranian regime to work with uh, on the African continent. And it's also competitive because the Iranian regime is increasingly um, competing ideologically with Saudi Arabia, with Turkey, as well as local thought leaders like Morocco in, in trying to uh, sort of to elevate its brand, to elevate its worldview among regional publics. And that gets me to the last point, which is that the Iranian presence in, Latin, uh, in Africa uh, is both dynamic and evolving. Um, you're seeing this footprint change significantly as a result of geopolitical changes over the last year, year and a half. Um, I, uh, back in April, uh, I know we're all uh, mostly still locked down. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to jump out of the United States to uh, spend a week in Morocco at the invitation of the foreign ministry. Um, fascinating trip, particularly at that time. Um, but I was particularly struck by my conversations with Moroccan officials uh, about the emphasis that they placed on their concern over what the, they see as an escalating pattern of Iranian involvement in Africa. And I had one very senior official tell me, quote, it's no longer accurate to just speak about Iran in West Africa. The Iranians are all over the continent now. So my logical question here was, why is this happening? Um, and the reasons the Moroccan officials gave me uh, were essentially threefold. The first is that uh, it's all about strategic opportunism. Africa is growing in global economic and political significance. Africa is the next hotspot in terms of demographics. The, uh, by the demographers say that by 2050, the population of Africa is going to essentially double um, to uh, uh, something like 1.8 uh, 1. billion people. Um, and uh, Africa is the world's youngest continent, the median age of all Africans is something like 19 years old. So 60 seconds uh, this is oh, very good. So, so this is uh, very much a uh, sort of an area that the Iranian regime sees in terms of growth. The second is it's a response to maximum pressure. Just like in the old days, the Iranian regime was looking at theaters like Latin America to uh, help it skirt and withstand Western sanctions. It is now looking at Africa as well, uh, especially in the face of maximum pressure. And the third, uh, and uh, from the American perspective, most concerning was that Moroccan officials uh, said that they have seen this uptick in activity uh, over the last year and a half, especially since January of 2020. And the reason that's significant is because January 2020 was when uh, IRGC commander uh, Qasem Soleimani was killed by the United States. So there is a concern here that this new activism on the part of Iran, it's not just about building influence. It also has an operational character because uh, the Iranians are actively thinking about how to retaliate against the United States, how to retaliate against American partners and allies. And uh, they're thinking about Africa in that context. So I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much, Ilan, for uh, that very interesting and important uh, information that you shared with us. Um, now, we are quite limited with time, so I'd like to... Um, advise every panelist uh, answering your question uh, to just be succinct, but uh, let's definitely take a, a few questions while we can. And here's one question for the entire panel. Um, is it the panel's assessment that Hezbollah is building uh, a terror and drug relationship with the IRA? Is there anybody who is uh, interested in taking on that question? Uh, okay. Okay, we will, we will move on. Um, he, here's one question that I have uh, for both uh, Emmanuel and Joseph. Um, how have Latin American governments been responding to this uh, systematic infiltration attempt? And I know that that's a very big question because there are so many different governments. So just pick out what you think is the most important response to highlight. You know, we've heard so much today about this infiltration. What's going on in terms of pushing back? Is, is there pushback that we can, we can locate? Okay, I'll go first. Um, so th there's been considerable efforts made in the last uh, few years about being able to illuminate 
uh, Iran's networks, Hezbollah's networks in Latin America. Uh, this actually uh, led to several designations uh, of Hezbollah as a terrorist organization by a handful of Latin American countries. Argentina began this effort uh, actually going all the way back to 2016 when President Mauricio Macri came into office. There were very uh, courageous and important people within his administration in Argentina that basically took this mantle and, and carried the ball forward to lead to the first uh, terrorist designation of Hezbollah in Latin America's history on July 16th, uh, 19, uh, July 16th, uh, 2019. Um, in that the other countries that follow, Paraguay, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, but on the face of it, the designations are good. It's a good, uh, I think it's a good momentum, uh, but they're not followed up with a lot of tangible actions that can be taken by their financial authorities and others to be able to clamp down on this network. I think if, if I were to answer the question, I'd say uh, Iran and Hezbollah's network depends on having acquiescent governments in the region that either turn a blind eye because they just don't think it's important or their you know, allies like the Maduro regime in Venezuela. Uh, the concern is that more and more countries are moving into that orbit. Uh, I think Ilan actually said this at a conference that uh, we had in 2019, and I think he characterized it the right way. You have essentially three block of countries in Latin America. You have the, the sympathetic and allied countries, which are the Bolivarian network, the, the Maduro's regimes of, of the region. Uh, you have the uh, countries that are essentially ignorant of the issue and don't put it at a high priority. Uh, and then you have the countries that are essentially actively trying to do something about it, uh, at least uh, in, in some level uh, in their government. Uh, the, 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 the trick is to be able to take those countries that are apathetic and move them more towards the category of doing something, taking action against these networks. The concern as some of these countries are moving the other direction. Peru, I mentioned in my remarks and I will highlight it, I, I, I very much believe that Peru, during the new government of Peru is going to probably move in the direction of being sympathetic to Iran and Hezbollah's networks in their country because uh, they're already tied to some of those networks. So I, I, would, I would end it with that. Great. Do you want to weigh on, in on this, Amanda? Yeah, I'll, I'll just add, I mean, I agree with Joseph. Uh, I'll just add that there's been some minimal level of pushback at the security and intelligence level uh, against specific individuals uh, um, coming into several Latin American countries where these individuals were denied a visa, an entry visa, they were you know, turned around at the airport. But uh, generally speaking, and sp more specifically, when we look at the soft power outreach that Iran has developed uh, throughout uh, the region, uh, the governments, by and large, uh, seem uh, not to understand the problem, not to care about the problem, and certainly not to do much about the problem. Right. Uh, Sarit, a quick question for you. Um, similar to what I just asked about Latin America, have you seen the French government take action? Uh, we saw that in Germany there's been a, a wakening up uh, of Hezbollah's activities. Um, what are you seeing happening in terms of the French law enforcement and government response to the activities that you described? So on the one hand, they did what they had to do against the Zara Association, but uh, in general, I think the French has a huge dilemma between their willingness uh, to find a solution for Lebanon, and they believe that uh, making some concessions with regards to, to Hezbollah uh, will help them find a solution. And on the other hand, they do understand the, the problematic and the, the challenges posed by uh, radical ideologies inside France. And we've seen it with new legislation in France, etc. The bottom line is this, that France uh, refuses to designate the civilian wing of Hezbollah. And I think this is for political reasons, not because they don't understand the importance of this. I see, by the way, that the readers have had a chance to also interact with the panelists by text and get some answers uh, from there. So that's excellent. And I guess we will uh, uh, finish with a question uh, with Elon. Um, Elon, you described an extensive um, Africa infiltration program. Um, and would you say that Africa um, is, is the most open and available region for as far as Iran is concerned in terms of its global perspective? We hear about Latin America, we hear about Europe. It seems that Africa 
is, is really the place where the gate is, is, is open the most. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. No. And, and I, I really think uh, in the context of where Iran can expand, Africa is the big show. I cited some statistics during my presentation. If anything, I underestimated them. The last year, the population of Africa was about 1.3 billion. The estimate is by 2050, that population is going to nearly double to 2.5 billion. So what you're seeing is a, a cohort that's young, that's expanding. You're also seeing a lot of very weak governments, empty political space that uh, radical actors like Iran, state actors like Iran, also radical non-state actors, right? Uh, like the Islamic State and others are exploiting. And uh, so uh, it reminds me, uh, just for 30 seconds, it reminds me of, of the famous story in the United States uh, of the bank robber, Willie Sutton. Uh, Willie Sutton was a famous bank robber, robbed banks uh, all over the uh, U.S. Midwest uh, in, uh, in, in central United States um, in the 1920s and 30s. And when the FBI caught up with him, they asked him famously, why do you rob banks? And his answer was, because that's where the money is. So if you're thinking along those lines, if you're thinking like Iran about global expansion, about influencing global publics, Africa, that's, that's where the people are. So uh, I, I think very much it, it's a theater to watch. Right. Okay, that is all the time uh, that we have uh, for this webinar. I would like to also thank uh, the Council for a Secure America and to Elnit for enabling this webinar uh, to go ahead. Um, I think that this has been a very uh, precious sharing of, in, of critical information and insights about a topic that affects international security um, and that which we do not hear enough of. Um, so the contribution uh, to uh, the public awareness uh, of this issue is, is absolutely vital. And I'd like to thank each and every one of our panelists um, and the audience for taking part. Um, and that wraps up our webinar. So thank you very much and please join us uh, for future online events.